Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to this service this morning. If you are here in the sanctuary, will you detach and sign the registration of attendance slip so that we'll know that you were here. If you are online, welcome. And will you, if you're online live with Facebook, will you use the comment section to let us know that you are here. The calendar for the week is included and it is a fairly normal calendar. The one thing that we do want to announce, and this is the first announcement of a congregational meeting that will be held following worship next Sunday. The purpose of this congregational meeting is to hear a report of the Congregational Officer Nominating Committee who will be nominating uh, a slate of people for a pastor nominating committee. A committee nominating a committee. How Presbyterian is that? But that's, but that's the way we do it. And uh, so we hope that you'll be here uh, next week. The essentials, the announcements show that we welcomed at the last regular session meeting, two new members, Ken and Judy Johnson, into our First Presbyterian family. They, that Ken and Judy are the parents of Debbie Edling, and uh, they are essentially homebound, so they are going to be a part of our online congregation, and we want to find creative ways to welcome them to the family. I hope it's not an omen, but um, on Thursday, Ken fell and broke a hip. And so he had successful surgery for that on Friday and is currently in uh, Lake Point Hospital. Uh, Judy is there with him. And uh, then speaking of the Edlings, their oldest son, Nathan, had a planned procedure which involved breaking both the top and lower jaws. And so that's where Debbie is today, home taking care of Nathan. And Nathan will uh, be recovering for, from that for a while. So in our prayers, let us keep these friends in mind. And I think that's all I have to share with you today. So will you join me for the call to worship? Our help is in the name of the Lord. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Our opening hymn is 687. <laughs>
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to the world in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O merciful God, for his sake, that we may live a holy, just, and humble life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. God. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And, and also with you. Please share the peace with those around you. All right, thank you. You may be seated. And, well, we've got some of the children here. Will you all come and join me up there? Okay. I'm going to move closer to you. <laughs> Jesus once said, and we're going to talk about this today, that anyone that humbles himself will be exalted, and anybody who exalts himself will be humble. Now, what do you think that means? Got any idea? Do you know what humble means? What's it mean? It means to be truthful, it, uh, but it also means not to uh, push yourself up too high. It, uh, it means that uh, you see yourself, as a matter of fact, Jesus taught us how to be humble, didn't he? I mean, there was a time when they were having a meal together, and it was right before Jesus died that uh, the disciples came in, the roads had been a mess, and everybody's feet was dirty, and they were getting ready to have a meal, and they wouldn't have it with dirty feet. And so Jesus, they wouldn't wash each other's feet, because to wash each other's feet, that would have made them humble. So who washed their feet, do you suppose? Jesus. Jesus said, that uh, if you won't do it, let me, let me wash your feet because I am your servant. And that's what Jesus in all of his life taught us to do, is to do for others. Now, when you see somebody that says, I am the greatest, does that impress you? Nah. It, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, what, do you, what do you think? when somebody says, I am the greatest, do you believe it? Nah. 
do you tend to think, no, you're not, you're just full of wind or, uh, or, or something else. But anyway, <laughs> but uh, that, and when somebody is saying, I am the greatest, that's somebody, that's what exalted means. They're trying to exalt themselves. But the life that you live, if you live like Jesus did, you will do things for other people. You will be kind to other people. Uh, you will help other people. You will build up other people. And you know what? They'll like you a lot better. Because that's showing love, and we know that love always triumphs. And that's what Jesus teaches us. So, if you humble yourself, uh, you'll be exalted. But if you exalt yourself, somebody's going to bring you down. And that's what we're talking about later here today. And that's what I want you to remember this week. So let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you for coming among us, for teaching us how to be humble, so we'll learn how to be exalted. We pray that we follow Jesus every day. And we pray in his name. Amen. Or amen. I got called on that by some of you at one time. So you can use amen or amen. Now, Clark, Kevin has something that he wants to give you. And here he comes. There's Kevin. There I am. This is the third grade Bible. You wouldn't think there was. Now, Tom and I have been talking to Clark before that. And you know, he doesn't look like he's 18, does he? But, uh, <laughs> but we have gotten convinced that he's a little small for his age, but that's okay. No, he's not really 18, he's eight. And, uh, but we've been giving him a hard time about being 18. Anyway. And we, gave, we were able to give Nicholas his third grade Bible on rally day. Clark was actually in London, and, and I confirmed not London, Kentucky, but like London, England. And so uh, he wasn't able to be here, but uh, we wanted to recognize him today and give him his own third grade Bible. Well, you're welcome. All right, y'all can go to Godly Play.
Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from Proverbs chapter 25, verses 2 through 7. Let us listen for God's word. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. Like the heavens for height, like the earth for depth, so the mind of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from the silver, and the smith has material for a vessel. Take away the wicked from the presence of the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. Our New Testament reading is from Luke chapter 14, verses 1 and 7 through 14. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come to you and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is number 203. There's an old expression that says, low doorways are pretty hard on 
high hats. It was based upon a term high hat that has to do when people had an exaggerated sense of their importance. It's a term that's really no longer in use, but we can guess at the translation anyway. Life is full of humbling experiences for the high and mighty. And don't we just love to see that unduly conceited person who is put in their place? Of course, it isn't much fun to be the one that is uh, put in our place. An overrated sense of importance can set ourselves up to be put down. And for a while, we use the word dist for that. A proper humility has always been the hallmark of Christian virtue, even if it's not popular. It is said that the Amish people built their doorways intentionally low so that one's head must be bowed to go through it and thus is reminded to be humble. But such an idea seems archaic, almost unthinkable according to current trends. And then we come to the text today from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. These are familiar words, even if they are uh, often overlooked or ignored. Jesus uh, spoke those words while he was observing people that were coming in and taking their places uh, at a banquet. If we picture that in today's images, an important uh, dinner or banquet always has a head table. And we know the most important guests are seated at the head table, and the more important, the more closer to the center you may be. One can imagine entering a banquet and taking note of who is seated at the head table. And wouldn't it be embarrassing to have seated yourself at the head table only be to be told that you didn't belong there? On the other hand, what an ego boost it would be to have seated yourself somewhere else and been to be asked in front of everyone else to come and be seated at the head table. Now, that is the setting for these words of Jesus. So here Jesus is giving some good and practical advice about avoiding embarrassment. Of course, we always look for a deeper meaning when Jesus gives what appears to be just some practical counsel. And there is one here. But Jesus is down to earth enough to give advice that could be taken at face value. But we said there is more. One of the first requirements for the citizenship in the kingdom of God, as well as an important ingredient for success in life itself, is wrapped up in watching out for life's low doorways. Presbyterian thinking rests upon the foundation that is laid by the theological system uh, developed in the 16th century by John Calvin. The first of his five steps seems to echo today's text from Luke. You know what that first step is? It's total depravity. For Calvin, anyone who begins a successful journey of faith will have to start with a true and accurate estimation of self. And that is, by the way, why we always have that prayer of confession that's uh, situated early in the worship service. The idea being that you need a right estimation of self. You need to know your need 
if you are going to be ready to listen to anything, to be taught anything, to hear the words the Holy Spirit may be giving through human elements that read scripture and interpret it. For Calvin, a journey of faith starts with an accurate, uh, an accurate estimation of self, but total depravity, that has such a harsh and unpleasant ring to it. I looked up the word depraved online to see what the formal definition is, and it says, characterized by corruption, perverted, evil. So there you have Calvin's understanding of human nature, the recognition of which is the first step to salvation. Welcome to Sunday morning. Now, if you think perceptively about that, you may wonder how that first step works alongside another basic tenet of our Judeo-Christian heritage that we are created, all of us, in the divine image. In fact, if you go further, the weight of scripture indicates that we human beings are actually partners with God in the continuing work of creation. God's spirit is the critical motivating force and we are the agents, we are the hands, we're the feet, we're the voice. We human beings seem to occupy a pretty important place in the scheme of things. Still, if we function as scripture indicates we are intended to, we begin with humbling self. So what I want to talk about is how does a person fall into the trap of exalting self and what are the pitfalls of exalting self? Well, the first one is obvious. It's when you put self at the center of things. It lies in this attitude, it's all about me, which results in the need to be the center of attraction. Uh, when Kermit Roosevelt, the son of President Theodore Roosevelt was in college, and his father was in the White House, the president made a statement that raised a lot of controversy. Because Theodore Roosevelt was a blunt and an outspoken man, he was often in public relations trouble. Kermit's classmates were discussing the controversy one day, and Kermit, his son, felt a need to make some response. And he said, Dad's all right. And then after a reflective moment, he added, the trouble with dad is that he's got to be either the bride at the wedding or the corpse at the funeral. <laughs> now, there are a lot of people who find themselves in difficulty that arise from that very same need. When that happens, there's little room for real awareness, much less a helpful affirmation of other people. Number two, exalting self can lead one to be judgmental. There is always a danger of that superiority complex. An old cliche points to a bad example and said, there but for the grace of God go I. <clears throat> now a phrase such as that may be intended to express some sort of humility but if you give it a second thought, it assumes a certain sense of attainment, which it says at least, well, at least I'm not as low down as that poor sap. A judgmental attitude can be a slippery slope indeed, because it's far too easy to divide the world into black and white and right and wrong and good and evil. Somebody might begin a great work which is born of a humble walk with God. It may begin in trying one's best to listen for the voice of God. 
The low doorway is when the me, me creeps in and you begin to imagine that every thought you have is given by God and every move you make is directed by God. It's then a short distance to beginning to begin to believe that you are right and good and while anyone who sees things different from you is wrong and if they're wrong therefore they're evil. To chase that rabbit just a little further there's a counterbalance. Two things are necessary if we are to get it right and not be judgmental. One is the prayerful reading of scripture and the other is the conversation and the counsel of others who are also seeking to be directed by God. It is the consensus of the family of God that truth is usually found and if we could understand that it would make a whole lot of difference in the harmony that we find in our churches and in the lack of harmony that we find in our country right now. Third pitfall, exalting self keeps us from proper relationships. <laughs> the problem with trying to get uh, uh, somebody to adore you is you may be dealing with somebody else that's trying to get everybody to adore them and you've got competing goals here. Too many of our relationships are played out in a sort of a game of one-upmanship. Exalting self may begin in vying for attention, but end up in struggling for power. Living in a constant state of competition may lead to gold in the Olympics, but it will not win any honors in relating to other people. This is true of general relationships between people and it's true in the special circumstances of things like marriage, uh, of, among factions in society, even in the church, as well as relationships between nations. Posturing and power may engender fear, even a kind of superiority, but it will never create love. And if the Apostle Paul had any valid insight, love is the greatest force for the long haul. Bennett Cerf once told of writer Carl Sandburg's conversing with two women at a party. And Carl Sandburg said to one, I am surprised that you are an actress. You look more like a person. And the person responded, well, I hope I'm both. And then he turned to the other woman and asked, and who are you? And the other woman said, I'm nobody. And Sandberg immediately replied, I am your brother. And Bennett Cerf commenting on all of this said they were then all set for a good time. Pitfall number four exalting self actually keeps us from the goal of being our best self. The 19th century Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard in an essay on humility suggests that we try to picture an arrow, it's shot from a bow and it's racing toward the target when it suddenly halts its flight, perhaps in order to see how far it had come or to see how high it soared above the ground, or to see how its speed compares to another arrow, or to see and admire the gracefulness in which it flies, and at that moment, it falls to the ground. So, the philosopher insists, self-preoccupation is always dangerous and destructive. In fact, I saw a good example of that on the, uh, the other day. I was driving on LBJ and somebody was in the mirror and they were checking out their due uh, in the rear view mirror. She narrowly avoided one accident and nearly caused another. And that 
leads us to conclude it's always concern, a concern when how I look overshadows where I'm going. A seminary professor once talked about the first time he preached. He was fresh from minor triumphs of high school and college speech classes and performances, and he confidently strolled up to the pulpit with all the brashness and self-importance that can afflict a college sophomore. To his dismay, when he got to the pulpit, he discovered he really didn't have all that much to say. And what he did say came out rather badly. After a few miserable minutes, he sat down in a mood of dejection and defeat. After the service, a wise old listener came up to him and put an arm around him and supplied a bunch of sage advice. And he said, young man, if you had gone up there like you came down, you would have come down the way you went up. <laughs> the fifth pitfall, exalting self inhibits happiness. No one is more surprised than the humble when they are summoned near God's favor as we have the images of scripture. Uh, Dante has a scene where he hears singing in paradise, blessed are the poor in spirit. The singers being humble were joyful because they could not understand why they deserved heaven. Which causes me to remember a snippet of a conversation I once heard when I was very young. Uh, there were a group of people together and someone had raised a discussion about the afterlife and what rewards might be like in heaven. They pondered how one could be happy when others may have gotten greater rewards. And the lady, she was our neighbor, uh, who was self-described herself as a fundamentalist said, oh, I think we'll be happy because we'll all know that we got more than we deserved anyway. The happiness of the humble. So there's just one other thing to consider, and that is how to achieve a humility that does not degrade self. Uh, the 19th century Bishop Phillips Brooks once said, the true way to be humble is not to stoop until you are smaller than yourself, but to stand at your real height against some higher nature that will show you what the real smallness of your greatness is. Well, maybe we can illustrate it this way. A local news segment had a host interviewing someone about making the Greek dessert baklava. The expert was having him do the steps of layering the dough and the melted butter and the crushed nuts, and I think you all know that's where it leaves me. She showed him how to cut the product into the usual shapes before baking, and the host did make a reasonable attempt. It actually looked pretty good. But then when he sat it beside the plate of finished baklava, which had been done by the expert, the comparison showed the deficiency of the inexpert attempt, but it also provided a model of what the goal might be. Maybe this plate of baklava is not that great, but this tells us what it would look like if it was great. And really, that's where we finally come to. God has given in Jesus the Christ and the scriptures that uniquely witness to him both instruction and a model of what a well-lived life might look like. One, our comparison is both to the ideal and the image of what by his power that we can be. The Gospel of Luke conveys Jesus' warning to avoid the headaches 
of low doorways and it invites you to follow the one who lived his life in humility so that others might be exalted to follow that one that can lead us from a false pride to true greatness. Thanks be to God. Will you now stand and let us affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And will you join me in prayer? Holy God, our heavenly and divine loving parent, your son Jesus Christ gave us the right to call to you in his name. And so we claim that right as we open our hearts in intercession, as we pray for those who have lost trust in your word because they doubt that you still care for and govern your creation. We pray for those who do not see your bright face because of their sin. For those whose lives are growing dark because of illness or their care of others or betrayal or injustice which they have suffered. We pray for all hungry, suffering, persecuted and abandoned ones, but also for those who struggle against hunger and misery, injustice, diseases, and war. We pray for your church that with renewed, resurrected faith and energy it may be a clear sign of the new order of your kingdom. And for those who administer public affairs at home, as well as those who bear responsibility for peace and justice in the far reaches of the world. Today we continue to pray for those who suffer from the ravages of fire in one part of the nation to floods in the other. For those who deal with viruses for those who deal with unrest, who are victims of racial injustice. We pray for your grace, mercy, and peace upon all of us. So hear now in our silence those prayers which lie at the depths of our innermost being. O oh God, you are the author of peace and the lover of concord. To know you is eternal life. To serve you is perfect freedom. Guide us by your truth and order us in all our ways that we may always do what is right in your eyes and a worthy reflection of your image that you have stamped upon us. For this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of all mercies, we give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all living things. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your boundless love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. Give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn, number 707.
when you go out into the world, if you go out this week, if you give him heart and soul and mind and strength, if you give that to him, it may lead you in the way of humility, but it's going to result in exaltation. So let us follow our Lord, that as we have seen him in his death, we have also seen him in the triumph of his resurrection. Life's like that. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.